floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sasha Jeroski. I come from Ljubljana, which is really not far from Trieste. It's about an hour's drive. Uh, my primary affiliation is with the Jozef Stefan Institute. This is a large research institute in natural and technical uh, sciences. Uh, it has uh, at least three departments that are working on artificial intelligence and at least five departments that are working on material sciences from nanostructured materials to ceramics and whatnot. And so far, there hasn't really been all that much interaction between these uh, uh, and uh, there have not been many applications of machine learning to materials in Ljubljana. Uh, special thanks to the organizers for inviting me because actually that has changed in the last month or so since I was invited to give the talk here. Uh, I will um, talk today uh, about uh, some of the methods that my group has uh, developed, uh, some machine learning methods that actually produce uh, explainable models and uh, they work on relatively complex data, molecules, uh, structured objects, and uh, actually you need to deal with structured objects to, to learn predictive models on them. But first things first, so QSAR stands for Quantitative Structure Activity Relationships Modeling. So here we are learning models for predicting one or more properties of chemical compounds. And the relation to this workshop is that actually we could do pretty much the same for materials. And, uh, uh, and as you can see, we are actually doing it. Now, um, just to illustrate this, uh, the task of QSAR modeling is to predict the property of chemical compounds, for example, activity against a particular pathogen, say tuberculosis. And you can see uh, on this slide already that the compounds are naturally represented by graphs. And the property that we want to predict might be, let's say, a real valued number. So this is uh, actually a regression on, on structured, uh, structured objects. Now, uh, when I say complex data, you know, it's useful to have a reference. What is simple and what are we comparing complex to? And uh, um, simple uh, data form that uh, uh, I take as baseline is what most people are used to actually from statistics from uh, several hundreds of years ago, where you have a single table of data uh, where you have a target property or dependent variable that you want to predict on one hand, and then you have a bunch of independent uh, uh, variables that you want to use in the predictive models. And we can talk about regression tasks if all of the um, columns are real valued, but if the target column that we want to predict is discrete, let's say has just values yes or no, we are talking about classification problems. So this is, this is our baseline, this is what I will call uh, simple, uh, simple data. And when we talk about complex data, there is actually quite a few additional dimensions of complexity that you might consider. There's been a lot of talk about big data. I'm sure you have uh, heard the terms. And uh, already there, there is a, a number of dimensions along which you consider the data big or complex. So one of these can be the volume. You can have large number of columns in these data tables, which I showed. And here you need to do some uh, selection on those or maybe estimating the importance. Then you can have a large number of rows or, or massive data. And the extreme of this is the paradigm of data streams where you, know, you have potentially infinite number of data points and the data just keep coming and keep coming and keep coming. And you cannot count on loading all of the data before you start processing, but you really need to do incremental learning from the data as the data arrives and then you need to throw the data away uh, and focus on the new data that is coming. But uh, another important aspect is actually the variety of the data. And this is the, the dimension of complexity where we compare it to the simple tables which we, we saw on the, on the previous slide. And uh, we can have structured inputs as a type of complexity. We can also have structured outputs as a type of complexity. So this slide you already saw where the data are not really just throws in the table, but naturally have a structure. For example, you can represent molecules as graphs. Uh, this is the case of structured inputs. And I will show a bit later other examples of, of uh, structured, structured inputs. But then there is also structured outputs where the value that you want to predict is not just a simple scalar. This can be a vector, but maybe even a hierarchical structure, let's say in the case of hierarchical uh, classification. 
So here we have the two basic tasks of multi-target classification and multi-target regression, where you need to predict a number of discrete variables or a number of continuous variables uh, simultaneously. And the very natural example of such a task is actually weather prediction. Of course, certain aspects of the weather, uh, if we would just want to predict the outlook, uh, whether it will be sunny or overcast, uh, this is a classification problem. If we want to predict the temperature, let's say degrees Celsius, this is a regression problem. But really, weather is a complex phenomenon. You should really take a look at the outlook, the temperature, the humidity, the potential quantity of precipitation, the wind, the direction of the wind, you know, the magnitude of the wind. So these are all, uh, there's a whole number of variables that describe the weather and that are interrelated and they make a lot of sense it makes a lot of sense to predict them all together rather than each of them separately. So this is the motivation for developing uh, methods for multi-target multi prediction. Okay, and actually we have a whole taxonomy of multi-target prediction tasks. We can have, of course, we already saw multi-target regression and multi-target classification, but you can actually have additional layers of structure on the, on the target variables that you want to predict. A case is po in point is hierarchical multi-label classification, where the labels that you want to predict uh, um, uh, have some relations between them, and these relations are hierarchically structured. For example, this can be the case if you want to predict the species, uh, let's say, present in a certain sample of, uh, of water taken, let's say, from the Adriatic Sea just uh, a few minutes from here. Uh, and uh, there, the living organisms are organized in a taxonomy, and actually in each sample you can have more than one uh, animal or plant present. So this is clearly a task of multi-target prediction and taking the taxonomy of living organisms into account. It's a task of hierarchical uh, multi-label classification, uh, where multi-label classification means that each target can only be binary. Okay? so. Uh, this is an example of a multi-label classification task. The data in this table do not come from the Adriatic Sea. They come from rivers in Slovenia, but they are real data measured in the course of monitoring water quality in Slovenia. And we have a number of descriptive variables which describe the, the water, let's say the water temperature, the concentration of uh, different pollutants like nitrates, uh, concentration of oxygen and so on and so forth. And on the target side, we have a number of organisms for we, watch, we want to predict the presence or, or absence. Okay, and uh, here we have uh, an example of hierarchical multi-label classification task where we do have this uh, taxonomy of living organisms uh, taken into, into account. And uh, an additional dimension of complexity, even though you might not consider it as, as such in the in the first instance is missing labels in the, in the data. Uh, normally, if you want to solve a regression task or a classification task, and you have a data point where uh, the label is missing, you don't know the value of the dependent variable at that data point, you cannot use that data point in the construction of, model, uh, of the model. Uh, and uh, in semi-supervised learning, actually the task is to take into account both data points with labels for the target and data points which are unlabeled in the, in the learning process. And it's clear that there are benefits to, to using such unlabeled data points, especially when the labels are not easy to acquire, expensive, laborious, and, and such like. And a case in point is, in fact, structure activity relationships modeling. If we want to test a particular chemical compound, uh, for its activity, let's say against tuberculosis or salmonella, we need to perform an experiment in the lab to determine that. You know, we grow a cell culture, we infect the cell culture with salmonella, let's say, and then we try different chemical compounds to see whether they reduce the number of bacteria. And each additional compound that we want to test means extra uh, time, extra labor, extra money. In the end. Okay. So this is why it is very desirable to be able to also use unlabeled data in the, in the process of, of constructing predictive models. Okay. And of course, we, we can get exactly the same problem, not only for classification and regression, but we can get it for multi-label classification, uh, hierarchical multi-label classification, and multi-target regression. And in fact, here it is even more likely that we will get this problem 
because the labels are more complex and more expensive to acquire. It's of course more expensive to test a compound for its activity against tuberculosis, salmonella, lepra, and what, what else uh, um, uh, pathogens rather than just for a single one. So, so the labels are more complex and more expensive to acquire, which means we are more likely to have data points uh, where not all of the properties of interest are measured. And you can expect the same actually for materials. You might synthesize a material and then measure just some of its properties and not all of its properties that might interest you. So for some of the, uh, for some of the data points, you would, you would actually then have uh, missing, uh, missing values. Uh, and uh, these target values might be missing for all of the targets, but they might be missing just for some of the targets. Here we have just the value of the first target missing and for the other two, we have the measured, we have the measured values. Okay. So um, a case in point, which I would also like to mention here, uh, you already had quite a few talks about uh, neural networks, some of them today and deep neural networks as well. And in fact, deep neural networks are very good at learning from, from complex data, including graphs, you have graph neural networks. Uh, but a problem that they have is that, that they cannot easily explain their thinking, their predictions. And uh, another problem they have is that they are very data hungry. And in principle, they need lots of labeled data and cannot learn much from few data points. Granted, there are approaches like transfer learning. You can do all sorts of tricks to try to alleviate these problems. But naturally, they, they have this as an inherent, uh, inherent problem. And the kind of explainability I'm referring to is that, OK, you might want to explain the, um, the, the predictions, uh, but you might also want to look at the model that has been learned and see what is the importance of different uh, variables, possibly their interconnections, their interactions. And this is very, very important in, in medicine. And it is also important in different kinds of science, including material science. So uh, we, we have been uh, focusing uh, in, in my group on learning explainable models. And of course, uh, a very common form of explainable models are classification trees on one hand and classification rules on the other hand. And I will not go here into the history of AI, but really uh, the expert systems, the first kind of artifacts that define the appearance of artificial intelligence were focused around expert systems, which contained if-then rules to represent the knowledge. And uh, lots of the developments that took place in machine learning were highly motivated by the fact that humans cannot just easily state all of the rules they follow, but rather such rules will learn from examples of people, uh, people's behavior and, and problem, problem solving. Uh, in any case, uh, from uh, tables of data, like the uh, ones we saw earlier, and this is another table of real world data from Slovenia. Slovenia has a very large and lively population of brown bears. Uh, in fact, uh, one morning there was a report on the news that a baby brown bear was found just outside Ljubljana Zoo, and it did not come from the zoo. So, uh, so we, we have been doing some, some work on, on modeling habitat suitability and also population dynamics for the brown bears. And these are data um, collected by our forestry colleagues, which describe different locations in terms of predominant land cover, forest, grassland, um, proximity uh, to settlements, and also the forest abundance. And from this, we can learn very simple models, like the model here at the, uh, at the bottom in the form of if then rule, which says that bears like forests, and it should be dense forest and also bears like their peace and quiet. So it's about a mile outside of settlements that they feel comfortable. Of course, this is only for the, for the male bears. You know, mama bears are very, very fussy. You know, when it comes about their uh, cubs, they want a specific type of forest. You know, it can't be just any forest. It has to be beach forest. Uh, but I'm digressing. So um, the, the point is that we have explainable models that we can take a look at. I, I was just explaining to you the models about the brown bears, and we were making jokes about it. Uh, and uh, in a very similar fashion, we can, we can explain also models for multi-label classification. Uh, so here we have a decision tree for multi-label classification. It looks at nitrates, concentration of nitrates, 
this is uh, chemical oxygen demand. And if both are high, we, we come to a prediction that we have Nietzsche palea and Tupifex present. Nietzsche palea is an algae which is very tolerant to pollution. And Tupifex are worms and they really like dirty water. And so we have uh, uh, high oxygen demand, uh, lots of nitrates, and we have bioindicator species which are indicative of, of, such, uh, of such conditions. And similarly, we can have uh, decision trees that predict the composition of the structure of living organisms that can be found in, uh, um, in particular sites here for Slovenian, uh, for Slovenian rivers. Okay. And uh, uh, we, we can have such trees, uh, re, um, trees uh, for predicting one or multiple targets also learned on relational data. I, I was showing you earlier um, data about chemical compounds. These are data from another domain. These are uh, about movies. Uh, this is actually from the IMDB. And we have movies and we have ratings for the movies made by users. And we have information on the users, their nations, what regions the nations are in. And we can then learn models like, like this one. Uh, this one says that, okay, if a movie has at most 213 ratings, it's a drama. Else if the average age of users who rated this movie is above 42.2, it's a comedy or else it's a thriller. Uh, and these features have been learned automatically by the decision tree. There has been no process of constructing embeddings and whatnot, and then learning the decision tree. The decision tree natively operates with this relational representation, which is very powerful, okay? And uh, um, in particular for QSAR, uh, for QSAR models, we, we typically have structured data, which tells us uh, about atoms in the particular molecules and the connections between the atoms, ring structures, and so on and so forth. Okay, so um, uh, the last item that I would like to mention here is that, of course, individual trees are uh, potentially easy to interpret, but they are not always the most accurate. So uh, people quite often resort to learning ensembles of trees, uh, and uh, in the ensembles, we combine the predictions of the different trees to obtain better predictions. But then, of course, we lose the interpretability which is why feature importance estimation approaches used together with three ensembles are very, very important. And in a nutshell, what we have been doing in my group, we have been adapting these methods for learning decision trees and tree ensembles to A, do structured output prediction, to do multi-target regression, to do multi-target classification, to do hierarchical multi-label classification. So to address all of these different tasks of predicting not just a scalar, but rather a data, data structure. And then we have been adapting them to handle semi-supervised learning, the, uh, the uh, task of handling missing, missing labels, of course, three ensembles, and then finally also uh, producing feature rankings based on these three ensembles, and then some other uh, feature ranking methods. And all of these uh, are implemented and publicly available in a software package, which is called CLUS, which can do all of these things. And in fact, rather the Cartesian product. So we can do semi-supervised uh, hierarchical multi-label classification. And we can do, of course, three ensembles for that and feature ranking for that. Okay. And we have a relatively more recent software, which can learn relational classification trees, ensembles, and also produce rankings in this relational context. And I will not talk more about this more complicated case about the relational trees. I will now just very briefly uh, give you an idea about how you can learn these trees for multi-target prediction and ensembles and what are the key uh, things that you need to do to extend the classical algorithm for top-down induction of decision trees to do um, multi-target prediction, uh, also potentially hierarchical multi-label classification. So the algorithm for constructing a decision tree from a training set, first uh, it looks at a, a boundary condition and it says if all of the examples in the data set have a low variance of the target. Okay, 
so this means they are all very close together in the target space. And in that case, really, we can make a leaf and take the average of their targets or the prototype as the prediction. Okay, so this is the boundary condition. Uh, in, uh, in the case we have a single target variable, we are having regression. This really is the boundary case, which is also used in ordinary decision trees. Now you will notice that this notion of variance here can be actually generalized and it can be defined over multiple targets. It is the same notion of variance that is used in clustering. You know, in clustering, you want clusters which are compact, which have low within cluster or intra cluster variance. And it's exactly, it's exactly the same notion of clustering. So predictive clustering trees use this notion of variance from clustering, which is extended to the multidimensional uh, multi case, as opposed to just the notion of variance of a single uh, real value variable, okay? And uh, uh, if uh, the data are not very homogeneous, then we have to select uh, uh, an attribute, an independent variable to put in the root of the tree. And we do this based on the reduction of variance that is uh, done by putting that test in the tree. So whichever attribute, whichever test reduces the most the variance of the target is selected to put in the tree. The data are partitioned according to the test, and then we recursively construct subtrees for the uh, data sets that resulted from the partition. So really, this is the same algorithm for learning decision trees, except that this notion of variance is now generalized. And of course, uh, when you calculate the prediction to put in the leaf, it should really be a multidimensional average or other form of prototype or representative object that has to go in the leaf as a, as a prediction. And uh, this is just what I was explaining that this notion of variance is really the notion of uh, intra-cluster or within cluster variance from clustering, which is really the average squared distance between each example and the, the average, the centroid of the, of the cluster, okay? Uh, and uh, there are uh, differences, of course, between uh, doing uh, uh, predictive modeling, single target, between doing clustering, in between do doing predictive clustering. So in, uh, in predictive modeling, uh, you can see that your clusters really are compact only along one dimension, and this is the dimension of the target, because you only care about the prediction. This is predictive modeling, one target, uh, the clusters really need to be compact only along this Y uh, dimension. And along the other dimensions, they can be arbitrarily spread. And uh, here we have a decision tree, very small one, which produces two such uh, to such uh, uh, clusters. And of course, there is an explanation of each of the clusters, which is if uh, B is satisfied, then we go to this one. If it's not, we go to the other one. In clustering, in contrast, we do not have a condition uh, uh, on which to split the data. We have the two, uh, the two clusters and a defining feature is they need to be compact and they need to be compact along all of the dimensions considered. So really we are looking at uh, hyperspheres that need to be compact, not, not, too large, not too large volume. And at the bottom here, we have uh, actually uh, the notion of predictive clustering, which combines the two paradigms. You, you get a, a tree which uh, partitions the data into clusters, and then the clusters need to be compact along more than one dimension. You know, should you choose, and in fact, uh, the predictive clustering trees are, are, are general. You know, if you say that you only take into account a single target dimension, you, you get ordinary decision trees. If you say that you want to take all of the dimensions into account, you get standard clustering. And if you select a subset of dimensions that you want to predict, you are somewhere in between. Okay. And uh, the algorithm is really very much the same as the uh, usual algorithm for learning decision trees, except that this variance function here, which I mentioned, if you want to do multi-target regression, you sum the variances along each of the targets. And this is your new variance. So your variance is now more complex than, than it used to be. 
Okay. And you might wonder why would you want to, to build now a tree which predicts all of the targets at the same time? You could just as well build a single tree for each of the targets. And you, you, you wouldn't need to listen to my lecture here, okay? But the point is that if you try this in practice on average across a number of domains, you actually get a clear advantage of predicting the targets simultaneously as opposed to each of them separately. And here we have an example uh, from three actually domains. These are all from ecology. And the first one is Slovenian rivers. The second one is Danish farms. And the third one is uh, Australian vegetation. And you actually have quite a large number of targets to predict in each of these cases. So uh, for Danish farms, I think we had the smallest number, somewhere around 50, 60 targets to predict. In Slovenia, we had maybe about 500 targets to predict. And in Australia, more than 3,000 uh, targets to predict. And if you take the results on average, uh, the, the leftmost column is for single target prediction, we build a separate model for each of the targets. The next one is multi-target prediction. We build one model for predicting all of the targets. And the third column is hierarchical multi-label classification because these are all a community prediction problems. Uh, all of the species are living organisms. They can be placed within the taxonomy of living organisms. So we can do hierarchical multi-label classification rather than just multi-label classification. And there is a clear gradient of improvement, improvement if you go from single target to multi-label, from multi-label to hierarchical multi-label. And the last, uh, last step here is if you use ensembles in the end on top of, on top of everything. Okay, uh, and uh, the key to this, why this happens is that actually uh, you do not overfit as much when you build multi-target prediction trees as you can overfit when you build a single tree, okay? When you build a, um, a tree for a single target, you know, you can fit and you can adapt to that target a lot, especially if you have a, a lot of data, uh, then you can build very large trees, very branched, uh, however, if you need to predict more than one target, if you overfit one, you will be underfitting the other one. So, you know, getting a balanced a tree, balanced in the sense that it predicts all the targets well, is a, is a much more difficult task. And to do that, you must not overfit. And we were clearly um, actually measuring these overfitting scores, which are shown here at the bottom, uh, which demonstrated that it's really uh, the, the uh, prevention of overfitting that is making the multi-target prediction models perform, perform better, okay? And uh, uh, next, I would like to say a few words uh, about how we can adapt these approaches to, uh, to semi-supervised uh, semi learning. It's actually very, very easy. Um, in this function, which uh, is calculating the variance, uh, we don't take into account just the variance across the targets. The Ys are the targets. And the Xs are also the independent variables. So actually to this variance function, instead of the targets or in addition to the targets, we consider also the uh, inputs with some weight. And this weight actually can be, can be tuned and we usually tune it by internal cross-validation. And with that, actually, we can very, very well handle unlabeled examples. Because for the unlabeled examples, we can calculate the variances here. Uh, of course, for them, we cannot calculate uh, uh, the variance on the, uh, on the targets, if the data on the targets are missing. Okay? Or at least the contribution of these uh, data points to, to the variance. Okay, and this uh, actually, uh, you don't need to read this slide, but you will notice lots of red numbers and red numbers means that semi-supervised learning performs better than fully supervised learning. And semi-supervised learning can take into account the unlabeled data and it clearly performs better than, than supervised learning. What is even more important is that actually uh, by using semi-supervised learning, you can learn smaller models that are just as accurate or maybe even more accurate than the ones you got from fully supervised learning. And I have here a, an example, which is a favorite for me, 
because the tree learned in fully supervised learning, it only uses 50 labeled examples. Uh, you see it has 11 nodes and accuracy 81%. The tree on the right hand side was learned using the exact same 50 labeled data points, but uh, also the learning algorithm had some 2000 more unlabeled data points. And by learning from both the labeled and unlabeled data points, we get a tree which is smaller, okay? Not by much, but still, it is two nodes less and much, much more accurate. So the accuracy goes from 81 to 92%. So, so this, is, this is why I, I actually like this uh, uh, a lot. Okay, so I don't know how to turn this. High. Okay, good. Uh, so, uh, so, and the, the last thing I will mention here is that we can actually also produce uh, feature rankings because we can learn trees and we can learn tree ensembles for multi-target prediction. And uh, if we build uh, an ensemble, we can then compute our feature rankings by using, let's say the random forest score or Gini tree score or some other scores adapted from single target prediction. So we can have feature ranking for all of the different types of multi-target uh, prediction. And also this actually works for ensembles of relational trees. And uh, we are the first to actually consider even feature importance estimation in the context of learning uh, relational, relational models. So uh, before concluding, I would like to show a couple of examples of how we use this for QSAR modeling for virtual compound screening, in fact. The first one was a collaboration with Leiden University. We were looking at uh, uh, coast-directed uh, uh, drugs for tuberculosis and salmonella. And the second one was actually a collaboration with Trieste, another research institute, ICGEB. Uh, it's in Padriciano. And there we were looking for, uh, for potential drugs that would help recover after heart attack, okay? So uh, here in, uh, in uh, QSAR uh, modeling for virtual compound screening, you uh, actually construct some descriptive variables to describe the compounds. And this can be of structural nature, but they could also describe the compounds in terms of the proteins they target from some public databases such as, such as PubChem. And uh, uh, here you can see that actually this is a relational problem uh, you can have the structure of the compounds in terms of atoms and bonds, but also functional groups and also the protein targets. These are all one-to-many relationships. Uh, this is not straightforward to con uh, convert into a table. Uh, so as I mentioned, we were looking here for host-targeted drugs for tuberculosis and salmonella. Um, our colleagues from Leiden uh, um, tried out this library of pharmacologically active compounds, uh, more than 1200 compounds, uh, and they uh, measured the reduction in bacterial load. So this is a measure how effective the compound is, is in killing the bacteria essentially. But of course, you also have to worry not only about killing the bacteria, uh, it's not okay to kill the host cell either. You know, if you just kill everything and you kill both the bacteria and the host cell, not good, you want the host to survive. So, um, so we, we therefore look at both bacterial load reduction and host cell viability. And uh, we, we build multi-target, uh, in particular multi-target regression models for predicting these two properties of the, of the compounds. Okay, and in fact, here we were able to, to greatly increase the proportion of heat compounds. So we build model from these 1200 plus compounds, and then we apply these models to the whole of PubChem, you know, to millions of compounds. And from these, we get a, a small number of candidates, uh, let's say on the order of tens or, or maybe hundred at most. Uh, and uh, if you think uh, our collaborators just went for the top five and tested them, this is not how it worked. They went through the list and they said, maybe at position 12, I said, oh, I have this one in the fridge. So do test that one. And then, and then at position 27, they said, oh yeah, the colleague from the other institute has that. 
oh no, though this one is expensive, let's go for this other cheaper one. Uh, and even so, even though they did not take the, the, the best rank compounds we predicted, they still got a much, much better uh, um, success rate of hit compounds than just screening the large number of, of, of compounds. Uh, okay, and uh, the, the second example, which I mentioned, and this was actually an example of so-called high content screening. Here, the effect of a compound on, uh, on uh, um, cellular culture uh, is uh, actually assessed by taking a photograph of the cellular culture under the microscope and then extracting some feature of that photograph uh, using some image processing. Okay, the uh, uh, task here was to identify drugs to reduce fibrosis in myocardial infarction, so this is after heart attack. And here we were actually quite successful. And very recently we had a nice uh, publication in cell death and disease. We identified one compound which was working very well and uh, then uh, colleagues in synthetic chemistry modified it uh, to be more suited for delivery to the, to the chest, to the lungs. Uh, so that was a very nice example of collaboration. And in fact, the, the other one, excuse me, uh, the, how, how do you go back? Okay, yeah. Uh, the other one for tuberculosis salmonella, this was actually also published uh, in Nature Communications, so quite nice, quite nice publications. But what I would like to say is that you can do more or less exactly the same for predicting properties of materials. And there you typically have multiple properties of materials that you would want to predict. And typically you have missing values of the targets for at least some of the materials that have been synthesized and characterized. And we were able to experience this firsthand and I'm using this opportunity to invite you to visit the posters. Today, uh, there is uh, one where we were looking at corrosion uh, inhibitors. Um, uh, then there is uh, another one where we were uh, looking uh, in, uh, into foam glass and properties of foam glass. And then one more for uh, learning uh, uh, actually um, up to predict properties of uh, electrocatalysts. And this, this will all be presented at the poster session today. I hope to see you there. And tomorrow, tomorrow Cynthia has an oral presentation about uh, mechanical compounds, about mechanical properties of tungsten-based composites. These are used actually in fusion reactors. And uh, uh, we had also very nice results here. And I hope you will be here for Cynthia's lecture tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the nice talk. I see already a question here. I'm going to give you the priority. Thanks for a different talk. And uh, I'll start actually about the size of the data. Uh, do you hear me? Is it echoing? Okay, so I'll repeat again. Okay, so the question is about the size of the data. Yeah, and the sensitivity towards the prediction of the model, because it's like whatever, I mean, like in medicinal sciences and all, whatever I have seen, change of the, I mean, like, the, I mean, like some of the features, numbers and all, doesn't affect a lot of the prediction is of the notes and all. So what's your guess about if somebody is trying to replicate that for material science designs and all? Yeah, so the, the size of the data, of course, matters. And some of the examples that we could have the problem So the size of the data definitely matters. And for some of the data sets that uh, we analyzed um, uh, for the poster presentations tonight, the data sets were very small, you know, and we had maybe like, tens of, of compounds. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, there, of course, uh, you cannot expect great results, but still, if you evaluate the results property, uh, properly, you know, when you test the predictive power of the models, if you do cross validations rather than just testing on the, on the training set, and if you uh, actually 
uh, have realistic scenarios of how you will use this in practice and adapt the evaluation to that, I still think the, uh, the machine learning methods can be very useful. And uh, I mean, and, and uh, what, what's your, I mean, guess it will be when you are, I mean, going down the notes, trying to find some unique patterns about two different like variables or features that maybe in case of mutual science design. So what you, you will say, when we will start to lose the interpretability of the model, because as we go down, we'll find some new things that we haven't seen on the data, yeah. but how much down we can go yeah, before we- Yeah, of course, a tree, a tree which is 30 levels deep is not very interpretable, <laughs> but uh, with the, uh, and this is the same problem with the tree ensembles, but you, you have this feature importance estimates, which are actually very, very helpful. And uh, our domain experts typically do look at the feature rankings and see if this has meanings to them. And uh, for example, this can influence their experimental design when synthesizing materials. Uh, this, this we experienced in one of the applications uh, in, in material sciences that will be presented tomorrow, for example, and another one at the posters. So if, if you have a, a domain expert which understands the data well on one hand and you have some interpretability, I'm not claiming that, uh, you know, the ensembles you will get to the bottom of it, but still the feature importance estimates tell you quite uh, some of the story. Uh, then you can get useful feedback for modifying the experimental design and exploring further alternatives. If I'm allowed, one last one. Okay. I, I'm around all the way to the yeah. end on Friday. So. One question. Sorry, you can, uh, yeah. Somebody else? Well, then if there's no one else, I will give you the mic. Okay, so if you can go back to the slide number 24. Maybe one before. Okay. Oh, okay. I got lost then. So there, there were, you talked about that. I mean, like when we move from the, I mean, let's say, yeah, this, this one. Yeah. So from STP to NTP, when you're increasing, I see that for Slovenia rivers to these farms, to these vegetation, different types of data set that you have, the increase from STP to MTP isn't always that great. Uh, yes, and there's a very good explanation for that. For the Danish farms, you have very few targets, uh, relatively. And, you know, if you have two targets, you know, there is only so much room for improvement. And also the room for improvement is smaller if you are looking at ensemble models rather than individual trees. So, so where there is room for improvement, you know, this multi-target prediction improves it but but there is no room for improvement or there is very little room you just get that little extra increment that is possible to get yeah. still it it really helps you squeeze out the most that there is in your data mm -hmm. yeah it achieves the achievable i get it thanks yeah okay so i think we have no time left but thank you very much again yeah thank you very much